it's Clinical Immunology, a major journal, and they're just going over some individual risk management strategies that could be helpful with COVID-19. And they have this diagram that I want to go over, and it's, I'm a little bit troubled by the, the way it's depicted here, but I think it makes some good points. So on the right side here, you'll see these three different possible outcomes that can happen. So starting on the bottom here, there is um, asymptomatic people, okay? And so a lot of people that get COVID-19 or get infected by the virus um, remain perfectly healthy. They don't know they have it. They're asymptomatic. And that is um, a good thing about it, but that's also a bad thing about it because what they say is that the reason this is such a huge pandemic is because of so many asymptomatic people that are shedding the virus. So with most influenza viruses, people get pretty sick, but they, they, um, they don't shed the virus when they're not sick very much. So one of the things that's unique about this is all of this viral shedding that's going on when there's no symptoms. So a lot of people are in this category here, and I've been trying to figure out like what the stats are on that. And apparently the best research came from this study in Iceland, and it was something like 43% of their population that they, that they tested um, who were asymptomatic actually had um, COVID or um, the, the novel coronavirus. And then a bunch of people have this moderate to severe infections. Um, and then some people get really, really severe and they get, you know, they need to be ventilated. And what this article is exploring is how to keep more people in that asymptomatic state and also how to keep people from getting infected, which is absolutely the best thing. And I hope that um, everybody on this call stays safe and does not get infected. And I'm really not gonna cover strategies on that because I think you've probably heard that in other locations, but that is really, really important. Um, so social distancing and everything. But what I really wanted to show here is what this mainstream journal article is saying about how to change a person's response once they get infected. And what are the things that determine that response? And so some of it has to do with age. And yes, older folks have a more severe reaction. Men have a more severe reaction. There are certain metabolic conditions, which if controlled, um, it may not be as bad. And then in this mainstream article, they bring up the microbiome. Okay, And that's something that you may have been hearing about for the past few years. The gut flora plays a big role part of how sick people get when they get these acute illnesses. A lot of our immune system comes from our microbiome. Okay, and I'll talk about that, strategies with that a little bit. And then diet and nutrition. So this is, this is mainstream stuff that it seems to me like we're not really hearing about on the news. Um, I think that this is something that you know, like our governor should tell us about, you know, I mean, it should be, um, it, of course, let's hear about um, protection and social distancing and all of that stuff. But let's also talk about what we can do to actually improve our health so that we have, a, you know, we're asymptomatic or we have a mild reaction to that. And that's, that's what I'm exploring here today. So um, let's talk about what the article says about the micronutrients for this. And uh, I'll go over this in some detail. So um, micronutrients are essential for immune, uh, immune competence, particularly vitamins A, C, D, E, Bs, iron, selenium, and zinc. And um, that's a pretty good list of them. And what they go over in the article is the, um, the research on vitamins A, C, D, selenium, and zinc, these ones I, I have right there, um, 
the, the scientific evidence that's supplementing with these vitamins probably are very helpful in this case. And they, they make a good case on that based upon, you know, what we know about immune function in general and, and some other infections. So let's look at that a little more. And then we'll also talk about the microbiota, the microbiome. So that again is the gut flora, the bacteria that lives inside your gut. What are the things that we can do to support that system of the body? And the first thing that they outline is prebiotic fibers, which basically just means fiber. So a fiber rich diet. And um, that makes me think of starchy vegetables, apples, beans, these things which we don't absorb, they're just partially broken down, they get into the large intestine where, where they form butyrate, which is the fuel of our gut that forms good bacteria. And this bacteria sets out to work to keep us healthy and alive, okay? So that's our friends and we wanna support that system. And, um, and they also talk about the, the possibility that probiotics, taking probiotic supplements could be helpful there. And I think they are helpful. What I have come to um, believe in the, in the past few years is that fermented vegetables are actually much more powerful. That fermented vegetables, um, such as sauerkraut and um, live culture um, ferments that you can, you can buy in health food stores, these are bacteria grown on vegetables that then have the fuel with them that can then make it all the way down and populate your gut. So I think both are good. Most of the research on this subject is on the probiotic pills, but um, many in the naturopathic community are now saying, um, actually, the fermented vegetables work the best. And I've come to think that too. So. Also what they outline, as they should here for the microbiome, is the polyphenols. These would be basically blueberries, okay? These are special bioflavonoids, and I'm gonna talk about them a little bit later there. Um, all of these promote the healthy microbiota and, and should be helpful with COVID-19 based upon everything we know so far. So let's talk about antioxidants a bit. And, um, this is a um, big subject in health. Many, many diseases, when you study them deeply, you, you, you come to these mechanisms of oxidative stress, that there's um, many illnesses um, are made worse when there's a higher oxidative stress on a person, and antioxidants can help diminish this stress. So I, um, I borrowed someone's little diagram here, which I think shows it pretty well on the upper left here. We've got the healthy atoms here, and there's, um, there's the nucleus of the atom, which is a positive charge, and then the electrons floating around it are a negative charge. These would be in balance, positive to negative are in balance there. And then a free radical, or an oxidizing agent or re reactive oxygen species would be an atom that is not in balance and wants some electrons. And so it goes and it takes them from the healthy atoms and throws the healthy atoms out of balance. Okay, and that's part of many different disease processes. Okay, so what is an anti antioxidant? That is this atom that is saying, hey man, here I got some, you can have an electron from me. It's an electron donor. And it, and it um, balances out the free radicals. It, it neutralizes them. So um, like I said, this is relevant to many, many different diseases. And how it plays in with um, the immune system is that the innate immune responses very often involve um, um, cells injecting reactive oxygen species or um, 
um, reacting, um, um, sending in free radicals into a cell that it wants to kill off. It's part of this destructive process. It goes and it kind of zaps a cell and takes it out. And that uh, gets rid of cells that are um, you know, infectious or um, like bacterial cells or virally infected cells. It, it clears them out, but then you have these free radicals that you have to clean up, okay? And that's where we need the antioxidants. And so that's why a lot of antioxidant supplements like vitamin C are helpful when a person has an infection, okay? So there's a lot of examples of this process in nature, like rusting of metal is a process of oxidiz oxidization. Oxidation, I should say, I keep saying that wrong. And um, I wanna talk about leaves a little bit. So here's this um, green leaf. And the reason it's the color green is because the plant is producing all of these different carotenoids special antioxidants that are um, neutralizing those free radicals constantly. But when the, um, the leaf falls off the tree, that production process stops, and then oxidation starts coming in. And when the, the carotenoids get oxidized, the molecule actually changes shape a little bit, and that makes it um, reflect light a little differently and it becomes brown. So we see the color changes in nature with this a lot. And I've got the example of the apple here. So an apple has lots and lots of antioxidants in the peel, okay? And that is protecting the inner part of the apple from oxygen, from oxidation, which is, they go hand in hand. And um, so when you cut the apple open, oxygen gets in contact with this unprotected part of the apple and it starts turning brown, okay? It's the same kind of thing. Okay, so let me just look over my notes on that here. Um, okay, aging, is, there's a lot of examples of um, oxidative stress in aging. Um, from wrinkling of skin is related to this, and um, age spots, those, those um, um, brown spots on the skin are actually oxidized fat in the skin. And so um, using antioxidants um, can, can prevent that. And um, there's lots of examples of this in diseases like heart disease and arthritis and major depression and all kinds of things um, can be helped by improving the um, oxidative status of the body. Okay, and move on here. So I wanna talk about the major antioxidants in food. And I've got a few different examples here. So carrots down here are what carotenoids are named after. So, um, Carrots have that orange color because of the carotenoid called beta carotene. And that is a powerful antioxidant that also is beyond its antioxidant capability. It's also an immune modulator. It helps the immune system become more strong. And it also helps to cool down immune inflammation. So it's, it's, good for inflammatory conditions as well as conditions of low immunity. And um, we've known about this for uh, like um, over a hundred years. There was, a, there was a research study that was done on school children about a hundred years ago where they, they did this big survey of children's diets and looking at what, what the children were eating and how many days of school they missed being sick. And it was done with like tens of thousands of children. And the one thing they saw very clearly was the amount of carotenoids in their diet. You know, the, the more they had, the healthier they were. And so you find this in pigmented vegetables in general. So the reds, yellows, orange, um, um, purple sweet potatoes have a lot of it. It is what um, makes oranges orange as well. And um, 
I want to point out that this is a, um, a fat soluble nutrient that actually builds up in your body. Okay. The, um, the, um, over time you get actually more and more in your cells to the point where some people, when they really, really overdo it, it actually changes their complexion. So very fair skinned people, um, sometimes, um, go on these intense carrot juice fasts and they'll actually turn a little bit orange and it's not toxic. It doesn't harm them. But I just say that to make the point that it literally gets in all of your cells. And I think that's um, a really good thing when you're, when you're facing illness. You'll have a lot of this um, reserve of antioxidants ready to go, keeping your immune system strong. So the, uh, that's the carotenoids. I want to talk about the flavonoids like are in blueberries. And um, these um, have even stronger antioxidant potential. And also they build up the integrity and strength of the tissues, such as the mucous membranes of your throat and your, your nose where you might encounter the infection. If you have stronger integrity there, you'll be less susceptible to infections in general. And it builds up the, um, the connective tissue inside the digestive system. So if you talk about issues like leaky gut syndrome, this is one of the things that can strengthen the cells, the cell adhesion inside the gut and make that system healthier. And it's also a nutrient that builds up in the body. So that's those flavonoids, and I'll, I'll stop for questions in a, in a minute here. Then I've got the, um, the uh, leafy greens up here, also have a tremendous amount of them, of the um, carotenoids. And then I've got these examples of these nuts here. And this is where I wanted to talk about the minerals, um, pumpkin seeds, which are extremely high in zinc, which is um, somewhat of an antioxidant. It's um, um, an innate, immune system strengthener. It's, it, it makes the innate immune system more effective. And um, you can take it as a supplement, but it's easy to get an, um, plenty of if, if you're willing to eat pumpkin seeds. And, um, and then selenium in Brazil nuts. This is, selenium is, a, is kind of a minor antioxidant that is very influential on your body's production of its own antioxidants. There's antioxidants produced in the liver, which um, um, are, are very important for the overall system. Um, and the one caveat I have to say on selenium is you can overdose it on this one, um, particularly with Brazil nuts. So like four or five a day is a really good healthy dose. Um, a, a big bag of them every day um, could eventually lead to some um, liver toxicity. So let me just pause right there for um, questions. Can I just have a question about eating the pumpkin seeds? Is it, yes. Can we eat them raw? Can we eat them roasted? They'll be, um, for the zinc content, they'll be the same either way. Yeah, the zinc will, the zinc will always be there, um, even if they get burnt. And um, what I've been getting lately is um, the sprouted, sprouted unsalted, from Grocery Outlet Organic. They're really, really good. And I'm not always, I don't actually care about the, um, the whole sprouted issue with this, but for the, like the crunch and the crispiness of it, it's really good. They're also really good if you get them raw and toast them. They kind of pop, almost like popcorn. They just pop a little bit and um, really, really get tasty at that point. So any other questions? So I, I wanted to go back sort of to the beginning. Um, yes. My understanding is that some of the people that really that have died and haven't done well is that their body overreacted, right? Yes. Yes. So where, what what does that mean exactly? Well, um, there's there's over inflammation. They're not able to quench the um, like the oxidative stress is what I've been reading about, and people talk about the cytokine storm with it right there's yeah there's a kind of over reaction with that and with any of these things that i'm talking about i don't see any likelihood that um supporting your immune system in these ways would cause trouble 
but there's been a lot of concerns that people have been raising about this idea of doing something healthy might boost your immune system and then that make you more vulnerable to this disease. And that's a story that's been going around. I remember that story from the HIV days. I've heard the same story about many different conditions that I've never actually seen it pan out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, I just want to say like, I don't think gentle, natural ways to support your immune system are going to cause an inflammatory override. Um, and, and the best experts I've, I've read aren't buying that either, but it's a theory. Right. No, I, I wasn't suggesting that. I was just wondering what cause, causes some people's immune systems to sort of run amok and go overboard. I think that some of it has to do with antioxidant status. Yeah. I think that, um, and I think some of it has to do with the microbiome as well. I, I, I think it's these, um, and then probably some of it is some kind of um, genetic thing, genetic susceptibility. I mean, I know there's some research going on about um, genetics with COVID-19, and there probably is some, some particular kind of genetic type, like there seems to be with every disease, right? But I think that's going to be the minor, minor player in this. I think it's going to be more of of some other things. And there's, there's other theories that have been going around. There's, there's um, um, research now coming out that exposure to pollution, like historical exposure to pollution, uh, for like for the past few decades, correlates with how severely people react as well. Um, so, you know, we'll, it's, a, it's a mystery we'll have to figure out, but um, I think these are, these are parts of it, yeah. And is there any link related to that with autoimmune diseases? I mean, for people that have autoimmune diseases, is there a connection one way or the other? I don't know. Yeah, I haven't seen anything about that. But yeah, you'd wonder. Um, yeah, those aren't the, the diseases they've outlined so far that correlate with this one. But we may find out someday that they do. But just this idea that your immune system is hyperactive already in your body. I was listening to one thing on the radio and someone said, if your immune system is so focused on, let's say, attacking your thyroid, it may not notice the invader coming in through another part of your body, you know, because it's mm -hmm. distracted doing something else. That was just an interesting idea. I don't know if there's any merit to it. Right. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Maybe. I had a, a couple questions. Uh, I heard very recently uh, that uh, it, the virus may attack uh, T cells uh, similar to HIV. And I was wondering if huh. you've heard, heard no, that before. No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Okay. Yeah. No. So you, you basically want to support your flora, your microbiome, and your immune system, um, however it is. Yeah. Thank and you. I've, yeah, I yeah. really appreciate this. Yeah, yeah. And I've, and I've gotten that question too about like um, recent use of antibiotics, you know, what do I do? And I say, well, you know, a lot of people have, have these things and um, it's, it, it, it seems to be the best strategy is to support your system as it is right now. And, and we don't know how vulnerable any of us will be to this. We just don't. And so, you know, we don't want to get it, <laughs> yeah. you know, to protect ourselves and to protect other people too, because on average, it's something like one person affects, infects, you know, two other people. It's, it's somewhere in that range. So, um, so we, you know, want to uh, stay clear of it. Okay, let me move on to the next slide here. I want to talk about vitamin C a little bit. This is something that's been in the news lately. I think it looks really promising, high dose vitamin C. So um, hospitals in New York are now giving their critically ill COVID-19 patients in um, IV drips of vitamin C. So giving people so much. And there's a, there's a study um, being conducted in China right now where they're giving 24 grams of vitamin C IV injected 
every day to people that are in critical care. And it's apparently it's going to be published sometime in the fall. And, um, you know, I, I would say that, uh, yeah, that sounds like a good thing to investigate. But what about using vitamin C um, not as an IV injection? I mean, because how, you know, unless you're in a hospital, like, how would you get that? You know, what about just taking vitamin C? And I would say, yeah, I think that um, if one got infected, I think that that's worth trying. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm not taking vitamin C myself right now as a strategy to try to prevent um, COVID-19 because um, vitamin C is not something that I think builds up in your tissues, right? It, it's a water-soluble nutrient, and, and most of it is just let go of, you know, a few hours after you would take it in. I think of it as something to get primarily from foods. The highest source are fresh leafy greens, and then, of course, citrus fruits, which have vitamin C plus these special bioflavonoids that increase the absorption of the vitamin C. Uh, so that's where I mainly get it, but I'll also take vitamin C anytime I start getting some symptoms. And, um, and um, there's a, a risk though in taking vitamin C is that um, a person becomes more likely to have kidney stones if they have it. And it may just be because you end up peeing out so much vitamin C that it, it gets in the urine and it, you know, it could trigger that. So um, that's why I don't take it all the time. Um, and then I'll talk about um, you know, buying some of these things. And I've got this vitamin C here with bioflavonoids. Um, this is a good one, 500 milligram per serving. Now, most of the products have 1,000 milligrams per serving. But um, as I understand it, um, the gut cannot absorb more than 500 milligrams at one time. So if you're taking 1,000 milligrams, um, you may just be um, eliminating it through the colon and it may give you diarrhea. Um, and it, it, it might be different if you take it as a, as a liquid, you might absorb a little more. So um, some people like this emergency product. And I, if you're gonna get that, I recommend getting the light without a lot of sugar. Um, I think these are, are good products. And, um, but remember that, that study that's being done in China is with, um, 24,000 milligrams per day. You cannot take that much vitamin C orally. It will not absorb. Um, the gut can only absorb so much. So, you know, what some people do is like 500 milligrams every waking hour they'll, they'll take. Um, I more often go a little lighter than that. I say every couple of hours take 500 milligrams. You know, it's, it's somewhere in there, um, and you want to do it to the level that is, is comfortable for your digestive system. But I think it's definitely a good strategy with any kind of um, cold and flu. And, um, you know, if there's, um, it's looking like with COVID-19, it's promising. I, I don't see any problem with that. And that's what, um, also I think vitamin D, like was outlined in that article, is a, is a good supplement to take um, in that um, journal article I showed, they were recommending 5,000 IUs per day. And um, I always think that a little less on the vitamin D is, is better. I, I generally prescribe 2,000 IU per day. Um, but, but maybe this situation warrants a little more. I think we get diminishing um, benefits um, once we start taking more than that. But it's, you know, the science is kind of emerging on that. And then I, th I think a, a good multivitamin is also a good idea. And I always recommend this one twice daily multi by Designs for Health because it has the better forms of vitamin E and um, folate. So those are some products. And I'll, I'll send out um, a, some, some links of, you know, of these and, and of the article too um, if people want to wanna look at these. So any, any questions about these? I have a question about vitamin C in general. Like, yes. like most of the products, does the source of it actually matter? Because a lot of the products that you get, it's mostly like 
it says like absorbic acid is it actually like extracted from the something or like is it good to take like a whole fruit as such or something oh okay um yeah i've looked into this a little bit and um so there are a few products on the market where they actually have a a food based form of it okay it is it is a very compact food that has vitamin c in it but if you look at the numbers they actually don't have very much vitamin c in there because you can't really concentrate it down like that without a molecular extraction process which is really going to be um the same with all of them okay so i don't think those those food ones are worth it when i get when i'm going for vitamin c i want it from either a food and that's my primary uh, way i think of getting it. i get it from food but if i want more than that i get it a synthetic form not because i'm crazy about chemistry but just because i know that that's really the only viable option on that yeah and same with with vitamin c and i mean with vitamin, vitamin d, d and with a lot of other ones too okay any other questions about about vitamins does the vitamin c need to be buffered does that matter um some people find that it's better on their stomach if it's buffered but i recommend just trying the unbuffered first and seeing if you tolerate it it's a, it's getting it buffered is not going to make you absorb more or make the vitamin c more effective but it's um vitamin c is a little bit as acidic right um but our stomach is designed for for acid so for most people it's it's good but some people um who cannot handle any acids at all um may need to have buffered I read somewhere that you need vitamin K to effectively absorb the vitamin D is that accurate Okay um what what I've seen is that it's not a, to absorb the vitamin D but there is a um there is mechanisms of um how the how the vitamin D is used um um it is helped by vitamin k all right but uh i say get vitamin k from leafy greens okay i'm not uh i mean vitamin taking a vitamin k supplement is fine a lot of people do especially if there's um bone loss there might be a little bit of benefit from taking some vitamin k on top of that um but that's that's one i just um basically try to get from uh from food. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Other ones to think about that are to me more questionable. Um so quercetin is um what one thing I'm hearing on the on um, discussions by other naturopathic doctors in regards to COVID-19, quercetin possibly does um suppress the virus a little bit. Okay? and this is a bioflavonoid that um it it's what makes yellow onions yellow and it's in green tea and it it's kind of like an antihistamine it well it's not an antihistamine it the cells that um will release histamine the mast cells which sometimes over release histamine um will be um soothed by this antioxidant and they don't react as strongly or as as out of control so people can get off antihistamines sometimes with this and i actually um i started taking it um yesterday because i've been my allergies kicked in and i've been sneezing a whole bunch so i use it sometimes but um and maybe it's the a thing to take um you know if infected with uh covid i don't see any harm with that but i don't think there's as much evidence on that and then vitamin A is something that's been getting a lot of discussion too and i talked about beta carotene earlier and that's sort of the close cousin of vitamin A beta carotene like one molecule of that when your body takes that in it can break that up into two molecules of vitamin A the active form and this is an immune modulating immune boosting nutrient and it can be toxic at high dose um i'm not prescribing it but i just want to put out there is it's kind of a maybe potentially you know potentially toxic but 
kind of interesting. We may hear more about that. I'm also hearing about um, melatonin as an antiviral against coronavirus. And um, that is something that people take as a sleep aid. So if you, if you, you know, are taking it during the day, if you're fighting the virus, taking it all day, it, it can make you sleepy. And in some people, it makes them depressed when they take it during the day. Um, and I used to take that for sleep. I've become a little bit concerned about some of the manufacturing issues with melatonin. There's a toxin that can sometimes get into the products that we don't know about. But fortunately, there is huge amounts of melatonin naturally occurring in pistachios with none of that toxin in it. And this is what I use when I want to sleep aid. I have about three ounces of pistachios, which gives me about three milligrams of melatonin. And um, so I just put out that as a, as a maybe one as well.